Thanks for joining us here on RT International. The world's wealthy movers and shakers have gathered, gathered in the uh, ski resort of Davos. This as plunging oil prices and turbulent markets fuel fears of a brand new economic meltdown. RT's Daniel Bushel now reporting from Switzerland where the World Economic Forum, the annual forum, kicks off today. Mastering the fourth industrial revolution is this year's official slogan. Mastering economic collapse might now be more accurate. 2016's powwow for the masters of the universe here is overshadowed by what could be a worse meltdown than 08. The price of oil, the great lubricator of the world's economy, this week slumped to a pathetic $27 a barrel. Last time that happened, top of the charts was a song called Lose Yourself. Eminem might consider re-releasing it in tribute to business chiefs here losing their profits and soon maybe even their jobs. Cheap petrol is good for us at the pumps, but millions in the industry could find themselves out of work if it's just not worth pumping the black gold out of the ground. So stock markets have fallen out, the ugly tree hitting every branch on the way down. Wall Street had its worst start to a year in history. And in a capitalist crisis, it's survival of the fittest or the best connected. All this week, we'll be grilling world leaders here how they plan to get us out of this mess. It's in their interest. The billionaires gathered here are suffering a considerable dent to their fortunes. Well, we uh, spoke to Dennis Nally, the chairman of PricewaterhouseCoopers International, uh, all about the doom and gloom currently surrounding the world economy. If anybody can actually predict what that price of oil is going to be 12 months from now, I give them, you know, they, they ought to be in a different business is the way I describe it. And so, yeah, we've got so many uncertainties about things that could affect the price of energy as you think about the next 12 months. The environment, very challenging. Um, we, de we describe it as a, a lot of volatility in the global economy, uh, in all parts of the global economy. When you combine that with the other big issue that's out there, which is all the geopolitical concerns that exist around the world, and obviously just having a really, really big impact on confidence levels, and that's what you're seeing. Well, there seems to be no crisis in confidence for Qatar, one of the world's richest states. Uh, there's been no end to its spending and top of its shopping list, of course, the UK. A lavish Highlands mansion for £7 million, the latest addition to a very large property portfolio. And it's emerged now the oil and gas rich state now owns even more of London than the Queen. RT's Anastasia Chokhanov reports. Smaller in size than Belgium, the tiny Arab country of Qatar is one of the world's most affluent. It's no secret that here in London they have been snatching up property left and right. Harrods, one of the world's most famous luxury department stores, was bought up by Qataris for a reported one and a half billion pounds, along with a handful of some of the most well-known trademarks of the British capital, including financial districts, historic buildings, and some of the most expensive real estate. This is not the Harrods that we in Britain know anymore. I mean, that's Qatari money for you. This has been raising the question, is Qatar well ahead of the Crown Estate, the largest property owner in the UK at over £8 billion, with reports claiming Qataris are now holding more property than the Queen herself. I just think England should be owned by England, if you know what I mean. I don't agree with it when there's so many British people and Commonwealth people that are trying to get on the property ladder. It's just who's got the biggest money at the end of the day. That's the way it goes. Not far from Harrods, one Hyde Park, known as the world's most expensive block of apartments. Flats here are owned by some of the world's most extravagant billionaires, with prices ranging from three and a half million to over 135 million pounds per unit. Who's the owner? Yes, of course, still Qatar. Also high up on the list of extravagant Qatari possessions is the Shard. 95% of the tallest skyscraper in Europe is in their possession. And the list goes on. Qatar also took over the Olympic Village after the wrap-up of the London Olympic Games in 2012, buying it up for over 500 million pounds, with the British government losing out on a reported half a million in the process. The list also includes the Canary Wharf Financial District and even the former U.S. Embassy building. Their wealthy hands are also deep in stakes of the busiest airport in the U.K., Heathrow, the heart of finance, the London Stock Exchange, and Sainsbury's, the second largest chain of supermarkets in the U.K. The Crown Estate decline to comment on this topic. Money talks. I mean, if we in the UK don't have the means to, to keep things in our hands, it's open to anyone. It's a national heritage uh, also, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah, I suppose they, they have to, to consider case by case and find some solution because this is 
going. <laughs> Meanwhile, you snooze, you lose. Qatar's wealthiest are more than proactive, with no sign of interest dying down. Anastasia Cherkina, RT, London. U.S. intelligence is to probe whether Russia has been meddling in Europe by financing political parties to destabilize the continent. That's according to claims in Britain's Telegraph newspaper, which says the probe was initiated by the U.S. Congress. It's reported that Hungary's Jobbik party, Greece's Golden Dawn, as well as Italy's Lega Nord and France's National Front are among those that have received Kremlin cash. We spoke to an MEP from Lega Nord about the allegations. Obviously, it's a hoax. It's not true at all. Liga Nord is a political movement that's growing more than ever in our country. And perhaps the United States doesn't like it because we're in favor of Vladimir Putin and his policy. RT has uh, also asked for a response from the director of U.S. National Intelligence, the organization that it's claimed will probe the alleged Russian aid. But so far, we've had no confirmation such an investigation is even underway. Well, we spoke to uh, several experts who say that if such a probe is conducted, it's a sign of a crackdown on those not towing the general line from Washington or Brussels. It is a variation on a theme that's been going on for at least five years. It is that anyone or any organization which holds views and which disseminates views that are, that are at variance with the Washington narrative is denounced as being a stooge of the Kremlin. I think that there's nothing true in this, because I don't think that Moscow really wants to destabilize Europe. Uh, the fact that we, we all see is that during the last two years, Europe has been destabilized by the United States. Let's think about Ukraine, and, uh, and not by Putin. So I don't think that Putin has um, the wish to destroy Europe or to make uh, Europe weaker than, uh, than she is now. In fact, the U.S. itself is no stranger to involvement in internal affairs abroad, particularly in Europe. It is true they did not want to do that. But again, it was America's leadership and the president of the United States insisting, oftentimes almost having to embarrass Europe to stand up and take economic hits to impose costs. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. All right, thanks for joining us here on RT International today. Coming up next, refugee camps in Greece and a report on the daily struggle of the children who live there. This is RT International.